Well, here we are again. I've agonised over what sort of talk I should regale you with this year. In previous ICMIs, I've concentrated on male disadvantages, giving a quick rundown of salient statistics and so forth. There would be plenty of new material over the last year to base another such talk upon. But one faces diminishing returns. You know the score already, and if not, well, look back at previous year's ICMI presentations or other presentations this year for that matter. I'm taken to task sometimes for addressing only the negatives. So let's start by acknowledging some good news because I think the trajectory is in the right direction at present. The creation in the UK of the new all party parliamentary group on issues affecting men and boys is a major milestone, proving progress can be made. So plaudits to Equilor UK and Mike Bell in particular for that substantial achievement. For the first time at this conference, we have contributions from not just one parliamentarian, as we have in the past, but as I speak, three and a former MP and shadow minister as well. The plaudits for that must certainly go to Mike Buchanan for his tenacity over many years. I detect that this may be symptomatic of a shift in the UK Conservative Party. Within the House of Commons, there have been many encouraging exchanges across the floor, pushing back against the tides of woke. In several notable instances, this pushback has come from equalities ministers, which suggests a policy shift originating perhaps from the unseen movers and shakers within the party. There have been encouraging signs, not only in speeches, but also in government reports. In this context, I mentioned the report from the Independent Commission on Racial and Ethnic Disparities published in March this year, which demonstrated conclusively with plenty of empirical evidence that it's not simply whites being advantaged and non-whites disadvantaged. Indeed, the non-white or BAME categorization is completely useless, not being indicative of anything much. In the same vein, I also mentioned the Education Select Committee's June report on how the white working class have been let down in education. It's so very encouraging to read a government report exposing the divisive falsity of white privilege, and I look forward to male privilege being trashed by government sources in a similar manner shortly. Well, fingers crossed. Those of us who have been pushing back against disinformation on these topics for many years may be rather incredulous that the divisive narrative seems to be starting to unravel at last. Let's hope that it does so with gathering speed. One detects that the Conservative Party has realised sensibly that the antidote to middle class wokeness is working class common sense. Maybe then this is the time to turn from itemising our gripes to preparing to do something positive to address them. There is, we are told, a tide in the affairs of men which, taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. On such a full sea are we now afloat? Well, possibly. So, in the spirit of being more positive, or at least preparing the ground to be so, if we want to be successful in addressing our concerns, I suggest we must first understand their origin rather more deeply than merely, if accurately, citing feminism and leftist politics. Specifically, we need to understand why feminism or progressivism or wokeism have become dominant in centres of power and authority. Why, for example, are Western national governments, the United Nations, the European Union and the World Economic Forum so floridly feminist? What's in it for them? Are these globalist institutions the useful idiots of feminism 
or are the feminists the useful idiots of the globalists? We need to understand this if we are to overturn the system. The essence of it is extremely simple. It's wickedness. And wickedness was ever popular when there are those who will profit by it. And so long as societal disapprobation for bad behavior is not vigorous enough to counter it. And the required disapprobation will go rapidly out of fashion if the elites profit from said bad behavior. To be slightly more specific, feminism favors disempowering men, making the common run of men subservient and obedient. And that's exactly what the elites want too. What feminism gifts the elites is a way of doing this, which appears morally laudable. In a nutshell, that's why the elites, those with power, so quickly adopted feminism. Allow me first to express some irritation with the all too frequent cries of conspiracy theory. Consider this, my garden has been overrun by weeds. That's not because there was a conspiracy by the weeds to do so. It came about for two reasons, because my garden is fertile ground for weeds and because I failed to stop them. Everything else was spontaneous nature, not conspiracy. Understanding our predicament requires only the identification of the fertile ground for its elements to function. And this fertile ground, I claim, is to be found in universal human moral failings, common character flaws. The observed phenomena will then arise spontaneously, provided only that they are not opposed sufficiently. In other words, if bad behavior is not consciously opposed, it will gain ground and become dominant. But there will be no such society-wide opposition if the policies or behaviors in question can be presented by those with vested interests as morally valid. So the burden of my talk is that the rise of feminism within the political and influential classes is based upon manipulation of the moral dimension. When I bang on about male disadvantages, what I'm really saying is that it's wrong that things should be this way. Our ideological opponents, on the other hand, don't think it's wrong. My use of the word wrong here indicates a moral judgment, a different moral judgment by the two sides. We can hammer away at statistics forever, but the irreconcilable disagreement lies in different moral value judgments. The feminist position on male disadvantages, when it's not simply outright denial, is either that society owes men no help because we bring our problems upon ourselves, or that we bastards had it coming anyway. It's a moral judgment, though a fraudulent one. My claim is that the origin of our political divisions lies in a bifurcation of moral perspectives. A solution to the problem of division cannot therefore be purely political. Politics is downstream of culture, and culture is underpinned by moral substructure. Moral authority has collapsed. The reaction of the authorities to demonstrations or riots by the likes of Black Lives Matter or Extinction Rebellion indicates total loss of moral authority. And the sickening phenomenon of taking the knee demonstrates a widespread failure to appreciate the difference between genuine moral virtue and sanctimonious showboating. Too many people now appear incapable of recognizing that such things as taking the knee and other embarrassing instances of virtue signaling are both crass hypocrisy and also based on a totally fraudulent moral outlook. Not long ago, few people would have been fooled, but we have become a culture of the morally illiterate. 
The crucial importance of this is that morality is what imbues politics with its power. Please digest this. Truth is not a weapon, but morality is, and morality is emotionally instantiated. Consider how the elites maintain power. How does a small number of people manage to control a far larger body of people when the disadvantages to the many in the larger group seem obvious? This is the foundational question. What is the mechanism by which the elites, the relatively well-off and influential few, manage to stabilize society so that they remain just that, elite and privileged? How do a few elite persons control the far greater number of those controlled? It's not accomplished simply by physical force. It's naive to imagine that elites maintain their status solely through the use of physical force. Even in medieval times, this was not so. Whilst it is true that the elites will be in control of armed forces and police forces and recourse to their use will be made on occasion, this has never been the predominant mechanism of day-to-day -day control of the masses. Mr Jones is being controlled continually, but it isn't because he has a policeman in his front room. I argue that the mechanism of control is an evolved psychological faculty, an inclination within Homo sapiens to adopt a common set of standards of behaviour, which we might call the, the social morality. The innate proclivity towards a common social morality provides a mechanism which ensures compliant behaviours by most people most of the time. It's the key to a stable, harmonious, cooperative society. But what if the accepted social morality could be manipulated, nudged gradually over time in a direction which suited someone's ideological perspective? This is the key to political control via culture change. This is why the role of morality in politics is a most pressing contemporary issue. But it's also important to appreciate that it's nothing new. Every political movement draws its power from moral suasion. The molding of the public's perception of the social morality is the key to the elite's hold on power. Past examples seem so obvious that it's hard to believe that anyone fell for it. For example, in the medieval and Renaissance periods, knowing your place was considered a moral obligation, not an imposition of disadvantage. In the 14th century, moralists, including the poets of the day, would complain about those who rose above their allotted station in life, Laws were passed that specified the food and dress that were appropriate for each social class, and this was accepted by most people most of the time. Another example is the belief in the divine right of kings. Even when the peasants revolted, rarely did they blame the king for their ills directly. The phrase the divine right of kings is difficult for the modern mind to regard as anything other than an obvious fraud. But that is not how it was viewed at the time. The point is that the peasantry themselves believed in the divine right of kings. So the despotic boot heel under which they labored was generally blamed not on the king himself, but upon wicked advisors who were misleading him. The king's divine right to rule was part of the prevailing social morality, which the populace were inhibited from challenging. My thesis is that there is an absolute or natural morality, but that the social morality adopted by any given culture at any given time may not align well with it. My thesis is that manipulation of the social morality is the key to obtaining or holding on to political power. This is moral usurpation. The obvious question then is how we are to identify of what this absolute or natural morality consists. 
have no fear, I'm not about to descend into heavy duty moral philosophizing, even were I capable of it. But it's not necessary to do so. Instead, I offer two simple guiding principles. Firstly, the line between good and evil cuts through the heart of every man and woman. And secondly, concentrate upon the personal virtues. The origins of our predicament can be traced to the failure to appreciate and to try to live by those two principles. Let me paraphrase the first of those guiding principles as a Christian might. We are all sinners. This used to be understood by virtually everyone, but no longer. And this is the cornerstone of the corruption which follows. There are now too many people who believe that the line between good and evil lies between themselves and you. And it's you who is on the wrong side of it. Lamentably, time is too short for me to go into the psychology of feminism. But one of the central attributes of feminist psychology is projection. Claims of misogyny or hate are projections of their own misandry and hatred of men. And their bleating about male power and control is a projection of their own, their own lust for just that and so on. I raise this here because projection is actually a violation of the first moral principle. It consists of exporting moral failings from themselves and placing the burden of these failings upon you. Projection is a refusal to acknowledge one's own culpability. The second guiding principle can be paraphrased in Christian language thus. Take care of the plank in your own eye, not the moat in someone else's. The great advantage of concentrating on the personal virtues is that with only rare exceptions, the virtuousness of the virtues is clear and the reprehensible nature and undesirability of their opposites is equally clear. I'll not attempt an extensive list, but consider the following virtues. Envisage, if you will, some typical woke person and ask yourself whether they display these characteristics. Charity, compassion, courage, empathy, fairness, forbearance, forgiveness, grace, gratitude, honesty, humility, humor, integrity, judgment, love, mercy, moderation, modesty, open-mindedness, perceptivity, placidity, righteousness, serenity, sincerity, spirituality, sympathy, tolerance, wisdom. You see what I mean? There's a great danger in talking about morality. It inevitably seems that one is setting oneself up as an exemplar. I am not far from it. I do not claim to be any better at achieving the virtuous ideal than others and undoubtedly very much worse than many. But to confuse describing the ideal with claiming to achieve it is to confuse a signpost with the indicated destination. Unfortunately, many people appear unable even to read the signpost. Moral usurpation, which I shall deconstruct shortly, is being used to fool the public and cause them to align with bad actors without realizing they are being duped and manipulated. I shall describe it in the abstract, but as I do, you may wish to consider how the various elements of the moral usurpation strategy are deployed in some specific manifestation of it of which there are a great many. For this purpose, you may choose feminism generally, or the domestic abuse narrative, or how this plays out in the family courts or in the narrative about deadbeat dads. You may choose abortion or the gender pay gap, gay rights, the trans issue, the rape culture narrative, the diversity agenda, Black Lives Matter, climate change, hate crimes, narratives about female versus male genital mutilation, 
human trafficking, or even aspects of the political handling of COVID-19, or in critiques of capitalism, or in the moral suasion that is the underpinning of the welfare state. There's no shortage of applications, which makes their common algorithm all the more pressing to elucidate. The process seems always to be the same. <clears throat> An outgroup is distinguished from the in-group. The outgroup is blamed for all the ills of society. Do note how this relies from the very start on flouting the first moral principle. They draw the line dividing good and evil between them and you. The appeal to the in-group is based on two factors, flattery and resentment. These mundane and universal character flaws suffice, but falling victim to them would have been prevented by greater attention to the personal virtues. Thus, both true, both true moral principles are abandoned to create the conditions for moral usurpation to be taken forward. The in-group are flattered by being told that they are superior to the out-group. Their resentment is generated by being told that they are being, and have always been, badly used by the outgroup. The outgroup is said to enjoy greater wealth and power at the in-group's expense, and perhaps also to abuse them in other ways. For the process to work, it's not necessary that the flattery and resentment are factually well-founded. It's only necessary that the in-group can be brought to believe it. What the outgroup believes is of no consequence. This is the origin of the divisions, which are the hallmark and motive energy of these systems of power brokering. The driving resentment is presented as a moral crusade and hence laudable, not a character flaw. But it is a character flaw, which makes the associated flattery even harder for the in-groups to resist. What's not to like when you are encouraged to bask in a warm glow of superiority whilst being told that you are owed benefits due to other people's past misdemeanours? It's so much more attractive than being told that you are a sinner and that you are owed no more than you owe others. I identify five components of moral usurpation. Moral infantilism, moral vampirism, the creation of zealots, the appeal to the elites, and the creation of positive feedback. Taking the elements of moral usurpation one by one. Firstly, moral infantilism. This is the means by which sources of apparent moral probity can be spun so as to progress covert aims. The key elements are promoting only one side of an issue, encouraging extreme simplicity or complexity, nuance, context and balance is ignored, everything is 100% good or 100% bad, disagreement is conflated deliberately with evil intent and extends even to the slightest departure from ideological purity. If you do not 100% agree, then you are 100% wicked. As a result of the above, division is created. There are good people and bad people, no in between. And recall that division into such in-groups and out-groups is always a feature of these totalist mindsets. Infantilism is essentially dishonest, even if in a given exchange there is no actual untruth. It is dishonest because it knowingly and deliberately avoids aspects of an issue which are unhelpful to the intended aim. Of course, this comes naturally to most politicians. One of the great attractions of this mental orientation is that it lowers cognitive load. It makes life easy. Under moral infantilism, there are no moral dilemmas. All moral issues are immediately clear. 
Infantilism is underpinned by misinformation promulgated by the media and education establishments, which have been inveigled to share the agenda by first falling for the infantilized moral position. Skewed selection of issues is key, especially in news reports and educational topics, but outright dishonesty also occurs. Dissenting voices are discouraged by subjecting those who make the attempt to severe ad hominem attacks. The key is to understand that all sources of moral cachet act as a resource, a currency, a power. By pouring opprobrium upon an opponent, they are denied any share in the available moral sucker. It has nothing to do with truth and nothing to do with reason or logical consistency. Morality is emotionally based. The moral infantilist is concerned only with the occupation of the ostensible moral high ground. When confronting a dissident, the infantilist avoids addressing counter arguments. They do not debate. To address counter arguments would be to admit that an alternative view is, in principle, possible. That is never entertained. This is a key part of the MO of moral infantilism. Its purpose is simply to prevent any alternative perspectives being heard or any factual evidence that might undermine the infantilized position becoming generally known. Because there is no engagement in argument, logical consistency is unnecessary. You can insist that gender is a social construct one minute, but that a trans person is, quote, in the wrong body the next. Infantilism ab absolves one from the burden of rational coherence. The second element of moral usurpation is moral vampirism, which consists of annexing and controlling every source of actual or potential moral sucker. If the issue can be spun to align with your covert objective, so much the better, but this is not essential. Moral vampirism provides three great benefits. You acquire an aura of moral probity. Your critics are presented as opposed to this moral stance and hence reprehensible. And by annexing all sources of moral sucker, the opposition is denied any moral legitimacy at all. The aim is to occupy every peak in the apparent moral landscape, leaving your opponents to wallow in ostensible turpitude. There is a veracity about these moral vampires. Their insatiable primary drive is to deprive the outgroups of moral legitimacy, and so to justify their denigration. It is not primarily about assisting the in-groups at all. It's about justifying their own hatred. The third element of moral usurpation is the zealot. The function of the zealot is to promulgate and be the living embodiment of moral infantilism. These are the foot soldiers who bring the brave new morality to the masses. It's essential that the zealots adopt moral infantilism fully. To do so requires the zealots to possess certain psychological characteristics which encourage them to adopt this infantile mindset. It must appeal to them. The most common feature of this appeal is that it permits the zealot license to be prejudiced, whilst presenting this prejudice as justified and actually laudable. The great appeal lies in the fact that the zealot was prejudiced against the outgroup anyway. And by adopting an infantile moral stance, the zealot is granted a free pass to be as prejudiced as she or he likes without apparent taint to their character. Clearly, the zealot must be prone to undesirable psychological traits initially, and hence be fertile ground in which infantilism may thrive. 
but moral infantilism further promotes these dark aspects of character by switching off the mechanism by which they would normally be identified as undesirable, namely a healthy regard for genuine virtue. The moral usurpation strategy the moral usurpation strategy is intrinsically prejudiced, despite presenting itself as moral. Social justice under this program is actually social prejudice. The anti-racist stance is actually racist. The anti-sexist stance is actually sexist. And equality no longer means treating people equally. All these inversions are actually an enforcing of preferencing. Thus, to be an anti-racist requires that you actively approve and promote preferencing of non-white people. And if you are so antediluvian as to treat everyone the same, then you are a racist, sexist, homophobe and bigot. Under moral infantilism, it is claimed that women cannot be sexist and blacks cannot be racist. The in-groups are defined to be without sin. The zealot places the line between good and evil, between the in-group and the out-group. They violate the first moral principle. But this is identity politics, in which you must be preferenced, or not, based on accidents of your birth alone, the contents of your character, and all your achievements in life, however laudable and self-sacrificing, count as naught. Pause for a moment to digest the magnitude of that moral perversion. But it goes unnoticed by the zealots themselves because guiding principle number two, the content of your character, is no longer recognized as significant. Now we see clearly what the appeal is to the zealot. As an in-group member, you can do no wrong your moral deserts are immutable, fixed at birth, and need no earning. You are owed, full stop. You are now free to behave as badly as you wish, without fear of losing your sex, race, sexuality-based entitlement to preference. But best of all is that all those difficult personal characteristics known as virtues need not bother you at all anymore because the contents of your character don't matter. Do you see how profoundly corrupting is this moral infantilization? The fourth element of moral usurpation is the appeal to the elites. The great strength of moral usurpation as a strategy to acquire power is that it appeals to the elites, the privileged, the established, the influential, the powerful. Why? Because espousing its ostensible moral precepts provides atonement for their privileged status. Indeed, it can eliminate the associated guilt entirely and even replace it with a conviction of victimhood. Thus, the obviously privileged can present themselves as champions of correctness without detriment to themselves. If you happen to be other than a straight white male, then this ideology repackages your preferencing as your due deserves. On the other hand, if you are a straight white male, then it's even more necessary for you to be vociferous about your allyship. Your devotion to the cause must be demonstrated repeatedly in word and deed. But best of all, allyship allows these sneaky fuckers to lord it over the supposedly oppressed people they claim to be championing. If you want real sexism or racism, look no further than these allies as they treat women or blacks like children. This is why it is the elite universities which have adopted this distorted moral position most ardently they have more privilege from which to distract attention and more patronage to bestow. And hence this whole faux moral posturing is especially valuable to them. 
for essentially the same reason the judiciary and parliamentarians have also been taken over en masse by the brave new morality. What's not to like, you can enjoy your privilege free of guilt whilst presenting yourself to the world as a paragon of niceness, and all with minimal inconvenience and at no personal cost. Moral infantilism is essential to this as it immunizes them against perceiving their own hypocrisy. So moral usurpation is the goose that lays the golden eggs as far as the privileged are concerned. It allows well-heeled feminist professors to occupy the moral high ground of victimhood whilst decrying the privilege and toxic masculinity of homeless men. This is such a bounteous arrangement that it is no wonder that its adherents react with such venom to silence those who would point out that it's all a fraud. That the system of moral usurpation acts most strongly on the influential is a massive boost to the process and accounts for this fraudulent morality becoming the obligatory establishment position so quickly. The false portrayal of many key issues which emanates from academia is maintained because the story they tell is the story the elites wish to hear. No arguments in whatever form they may be presented will ever dissuade those who have adopted moral usurpation out of self-interest and built their reputations upon it. The fifth and final element of the moral usurpation strategy is how positive feedback arises between state actors and the benefiting parties. This whole system of moral usurpation is subject to positive feedbacks, which assist in its rapid rise to popularity, especially among the ruling elites. One feedback mechanism will be familiar. It is that which leads to the ever increasing size of the state. I reprise it briefly. The state and the people which comprise it are naturally inclined to increase their power if they can. Money is power. So the more money which is theirs to bestow on others, the more power they have. The trick which all nation states and supranational organizations like the EU deploy is to take money off us and subsequently acquire passionate support from those organizations which they choose to favor with their beneficence at our expense. The beneficiaries of the state's largesse then support the state whilst always demanding more. The state obliges as they benefit from the associated moral cachet and from ensuring continued support. And of course, it isn't their money. So the state naturally tends to grow. The prime example of this mechanism is the taxation and benefit systems and public sector employment, which constitute a process which siphons money from men to women. That is one of the feedback mechanisms which increases feminist influence in tandem with the expanding state, and it will be familiar to most people. However, there is a second feedback process. Cash is not the only currency which can drive such feedback. The ultimate currency is power, and moral sucker can be a source of, source of power just as can money. So the moral usurpation exercised by feminism provides a pool of moral sucker from which the state can draw reflected glory. But in turn, feminism gains credibility from the active support of the state. This is the moral feedback mechanism from which both parties gain. That the moral cachet from which they both benefit has been artificially constructed via infantilization and gross misrepresentation of empirical reality is something that is not permitted to surface, perhaps not even in the minds of those involved whose prejudice may genuinely blind them, blind them to it. The media are the conduit through which this feedback is implemented, inveigling the public 
to go along with this, the deception. So as regards uh, who are the useful idiots and who the puppet masters, the answer is neither and both. Both elites and zealots gain in terms of being able to bask in the warm glow of unimpeachable niceness, as well as more tangible forms of self-interest. That then is the moral usurpation strategy. Let me illustrate how this perspective can explain aspects of behavior which some people have found puzzling. Douglas Murray in his book, The Madness of Crowds, uses a metaphor to describe the phenomenon whereby the target of equality being all but achieved, suddenly we are again miles away from it. He describes it thus. Just as the train appeared to be reaching its destination, it suddenly picked up steam and went crashing off down the tracks and into the distance. This would indeed be odd if the objective truly were equality, but it is not. The so-called equality issue in question is simply being used as a source of moral succor. It would cease to have value if equality were perceived to have been achieved. So equality must never be perceived to have been achieved. There must always be, quote, a long way still to go. Because ostensible equal inequality is the electromotive force which powers the moral usurpation strategy. The achievement of equality is as much use to a moral vampire as a flat battery. Equality is the last thing they want. Those so-called victim groups or so-called oppressed groups who are ostensibly being championed by identity politics, take note. You are being used and genuinely helping you is the opposite of what your would-be champions actually want. Think back to your chosen example of moral usurpation, be it feminism generally, or domestic abuse, or the family courts and fatherlessness, or abortion, or the gender pay gap, gay rights, the trans issue, rape culture, the diversity agenda, Black Lives Matter, climate change, hate crimes, genital mutilation, human trafficking, pandemics, or the welfare state. Consider in each case how infantilization works by ignoring alternative perspectives or wider societal impacts. Consider how each issue breeds its zealots and consider how the infantilized, morally usurped narratives are all so readily adopted by the elites. But most chillingly, observe how the moral usurpation strategy is also what underlies every totalitarian regime, be it Marxist or fascist. Moral usurpation leads inevitably to authoritarian control. This then is the system we must defeat. Because it is morally based, it must be defeated on moral grounds. The fraudulence of its moral positioning must be exposed to public view. Whilst the appeal to the elites may not be something we can prevent, the weak link is the rollout to the general public, especially the working class. It must be got across to the general public, especially the working class, that they are being conned by this faux moral system. They must be made aware that they are the losers. Feminism is bad for the majority of men, women and children. Feminism is the servant of the elites. <laughs>